Welcome, everyone. I am Lauren Bonner, Managing Partner of MBM Capital and Chair of the Board for the Muse Group. And today we have the pleasure of hosting Alicia Menendez, a prominent figure in media and journalism. Alicia is the co-host of MSNBC's The Weekend, the author of The Likeability Trap, and the host of the acclaimed podcast, Latina to Latina. Her reporting and interviews have appeared on ABC News, Bustle, Fusion TV, PBS, and Vice News. And today we are so thrilled to have Alicia join us on this virtual stage. Thank you so much for participating in this summit. Anything for you, Lauren. I am so excited to be here. Well, we're really grateful for it. For those of you in the audience who don't know, Alicia is a friend from college. And, and I can tell you in college, uh, everybody knew she was going to be as successful as she is today. So we are really grateful for your time today. Thank you. Um, Inspiration Summit is, is really designed to educate, uplift, and inspire our diverse user communities. And your book, The Likeability Trap, which I happen to have my copy right here, um, really resonates with, with our core theme. You wrangle with, with what it means to be a successful female leader and, and kind of the seemingly impossible expectations that it can entail. What inspired you to, to write The Likeability Trap? And, and what do you hope that readers, particularly women, will, will take away from that? Well, Lauren, everyone knew 20 years ago that you were going to be super successful too. So I am happy to see this all come to fruition. Um, but but the journey from there to here is hard, right? And I, I don't know that we ever properly prepare women for just how challenging it's going to be, especially if they're ambitious, especially if they work in male-dominated fields. Yeah. So I came to this question of likability as a person who cares very much about being well-liked. I am a cancer. I am a crier. If you've ever taken a Myers-Briggs assessment, I am an I INFJ, um, which just means that it is really important to me how other people perceive me. And as I was sort of in my own leadership journey, part of what I found was there was an inflection point where I felt that that preoccupation with likability was really holding me back. Mm -hmm. So I intended to write a book that was sort of like an eat, pray, love for likability, where I would do yoga and eat gelato and learn <laughs> less. And I wrote um, a, a much less fun, but I would argue much more necessary book yeah. about the challenges that women are up against. Because as an interviewer, what I did is I went out and I interviewed women about this question. And there are a lot of women who, like me, care very much. There are also a lot of women who don't care at all. Yeah. Um, who are like really out there just like doing their own thing. And I imagine that those women were just like totally free right? That they were unshackled from the expectations that I found myself running up against. And what I actually found is that they too felt they paid a price for being so brazenly themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that core tension became interesting to me, which is, okay, I feel I'm paying a price because I care too much. And these other women feel they're being, they're paying a price for caring too little because the expectation is there that women ought to care. And so that became the question that I was really operating with. And what I want women to take away is one, if this all feels challenging, it's because it is. There are all of these unspoken rules in the workplace. There are all of these unspoken expectations we have of leaders that run up against what it is we expect of women. And because they're so subtle, they're in some ways the most pernicious yeah. um, and, and the hardest to get around because it's hard to articulate exactly what is happening. So I want you to know it is happening. You are not alone. And that in as much as I will give you like lots of tips and tricks and tools for, for you to work on yourself and your relationship with likability and how to navigate it inside an office setting, most of the work that actually has to be done is structural. Really, yeah. organizations and organizational leaders need to be thinking about how this type of bias shows up in everything from how they hire people to how they promote people and how workers are supported throughout the course of their career. It's so true. I think we um, we, we often put pressure on ourselves to, you know, to solve it for ourselves and get out of the, the trap ourselves when really it, it is pretty structural. So anyone who, who's seen you on, on Amanpour, The Weekend or American Voices knows that you're an extremely effective communicator um, and you seem to navigate um, this really well. How have you personally dealt with the pressure of on-air likability and continue to, to show up every day and really knock it out of the park? Well, 
thank you for that. It's all a, a giant facade. I still care very much about what other people think of me. I try not to read the comments and I'm terrible at doing that. And one of the things that I found really helpful is when people are particularly unkind or they're giving me the type of feedback that women are most likely to get, which is critical subjective feedback. People love to talk to us about how we use our hands and how we use yeah. our voice um, and how it is we sit in our chairs I just mute them. I don't give them the pleasure of blocking them. And, and the corollary for those of you who are not necessarily public people is not every piece of feedback needs to be metabolized with the same importance. There are some pieces of feedback that will fundamentally change your life and your leadership. And there are other pieces of feedback that are really just based on someone else's impression of you and developing the muscle memory to sort through them, which we'll get to in a little bit, but I think it's very much tied to like, is this impacting the results of my work is a really necessary and critical skill to develop. I think that's so true. And I think, you know, many of us have experienced personally the sort of likability trap ourselves. And, and, you know, at one point I remember receiving some, some feedback that I should put more exclamation points into my emails, which, which felt like the sort of digital of equivalent of smile more. But I've, I, to your point, I've also received some some stylistic feed, feedback and and some other feedback that is helpful, um, that that is meaningful, and, and that has helped me in my career. Um, maybe you can share just a little bit about how you sort the signal from the noise. I love this question, and I also love the idea of a Lauren Bonner email with lots of exclamation points because <laughs> it's so like discordant from how you actually communicate. Um, so most of this feedback tends to happen um, in like formal settings, right? You have a biannual review and someone will say to you, Lauren, um, you really deliver, but you're just too assertive. Um, that or someone will say to you, uh, everybody loves you, but you just don't have it. And no one can quite articulate to you what it is, but what they're trying to say is we don't see you as a leader. And one of the best pieces, pieces of advice I have for both the person who is receiving that feedback and the person who's giving that feedback is that when, when you, someone says that to you, you say, thank you so much for that feedback, assertive compared to whom? Like, would you mm. say that about Joe? on our team. And it gives the person who's giving the feedback an opportunity to consider their own bias. The other thing, which I actually find just easier to execute and, and more compelling is, thank you so much for that feedback. Can you draw a line for me from how you perceive my style to how it's impacting the results of my work? And so someone might be able to say to you, you know, Lauren, I know you pride yourself on being deliberate. Sometimes that shows up as indecision. Just two weeks ago, we were trying to get this PowerPoint to a client and we were delayed because you spent an extra two days trying to figure out which font you wanted to use. Okay. Now I actually understand how the way that I am showing up is impacting the team and the results of the team. And that gives me more incentive and context for beginning to shift and change. But if someone's just like, I don't know, man, your emails rubbed me the wrong way. It's like, that is not that is not actually helpful, right? Like if someone says, right. emails are so terse that sometimes it feels they do not invite feedback. Perhaps you could continue being as terse and you can use whatever exclamation you want, but we would like for you to like engage or offer an opportunity uh, for, for people to, to share their input. Okay, well, like that is also more useful than just like, I don't like your tone. And right. so I think being really results oriented, both when you're the person receiving the feedback, but also like flip it. If you're the person who's giving the feedback, as you go into that session, first say, the feedback I'm about to give, is it executable? Would I give this same mm -hmm. feedback to a man? Would I give this same feedback to a white woman? If the person you're giving it to is a person of color, would I give the same feedback to someone who wasn't a parent or wasn't a caretaker? Um, and then secondarily, how do I connect it to the impact it is having or the way it is bearing out in the results of the work we do in a way that makes it feel more substantive and allows the person to understand why it matters? That makes a lot of sense. And I think um, asking for that kind of um, really tangible evidence can both illuminate um, what is signal and, and what is um, maybe someone's bias and, and hopefully have them come away with it from that experience with a little bit of a, 
perhaps a learning. Well, it's especially um, frustrating. I just want to say the reason I like yeah. your example so much is because we're also in this moment where we're all encouraged, most of us, depending on the place you work, to show up as our full authentic selves. And yep. And like your full authentic self doesn't use a bunch of exclamation points. And so you're constantly evaluating like, okay, is that a true betrayal of who I am? Or is it going to be a marginal trade-off that is going to allow me to be a more effective communicator? But I think what people don't appreciate is you're being asked to make those trade-off decisions every moment of every day between this is how I would show up as myself. Um, and and this is what it, the correction that is necessary. And like, here's the thing everyone requires an element of correction. I remember getting this assessment years ago of how I show up naturally versus how I was showing up in a work environment. And there was a huge arrow from where I am, especially I'm, I'm actually pretty introverted as a person to how I was having to show up in the office, which was extremely extroverted. And I remember the person giving the assessment saying to me, were well, you really tired at the end of the day? And I was like, yes, I am really, and this is before I had children. And they're like, right. They're like, because you're really gearing yourself up to perform every day and it is effective. It is getting you what you want, but it is requiring a lot of you. And just knowing that I found, um, I found extremely helpful. Um, but I think in this moment where people are being asked to bring their full authentic selves, for some of us that feels really safe and we work at organizations where we feel like we can be like, I gotta go, my kid's sick. Um, I just went on a cruise with my partner. Yes, it was an LGBTQ cruise. And like, I feel comfortable in this space talking about it. And there are a lot of people who just, a lot of us don't totally feel in our organization that we are being welcome to be our full authentic self um, in a way that doesn't feel like a dangerous stare. Like do it. And if it right. lands, great success. But if you do it and it's a miss, then you run the risk of being told you're not a cultural fit. And so in as important as that is as an employee, I think it's important for those of us who are ascending into middle management or upper management to think about the fact that you can't tell people to be their full authentic selves, but then not build a workplace equipped to welcome them. That's a great point. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that we see a lot when folks are coming to, to the Muse and Fairy God Boss uh, for, for expert career advice and trying to kind of sort out, um, can I be my true self? Um, or maybe I should look elsewhere. Uh, maybe, you know, structurally, this is never going to be the right place for me. And I think that's something you you, you touched on a lot in your book at, as you were sort of wrapping up about um, there's only so much you can do. Um, in, in an environment that just isn't going to work for you. Um, I, I know it's very nuanced and it's a hard question, but kind of at what point do, do you feel like someone someone says, okay, it's really time for me to move on and, and look for something else? I had a friend, this, this was not an original thought on her part, so forgive me, but she, she, she has this concept of, or she was gifted this concept of, are you a dirt road person, a gravel road person, or a paved road person? Which I think is like a really interesting way of thinking of like, are you the type of person who wants to work at like a gritty nonprofit or a startup yeah. where like there aren't, there aren't a lot of rules and there's no HR department sometimes to appeal yeah. to, but like there's just like ton of opportunity and like you really could change everything at a moment's notice? Are you someone who's sort of like midway in between where you want something that is like semi-established but growing? Or like, are you able to work at a large corporation where like the check clears every two weeks and you get health insurance and there's like a path, but like people are not getting promoted every six months, right? right. Like things are moving at a much slower pace. And that to me helped me understand that some of those trade-offs are just like big and macro and like mm. bigger than any single place you choose to work. So within that framework though, the thing that I'm always looking for personally is opportunity. Like, is there room to grow and learn? And I think in as much as it is about fit, which I think really is something that in an ideal sense, you wanna be assessing at the outset before you accept a job offer, speaking to a few people who work there, asking a few provocative questions once you've already been offered the job about just like just getting a sense of the vibe of the place. Um, once you're in a place, I, I think you're looking to see like in a way that is sustainable, right? Like everyone's not given a stretch assignment every week, but in a way that matches your professional metabolism. Like if I need to feel once a month that I did something that was a little scary and a little risky and like pushed me to grow. Um, if that, if you're the person who needs that every month and you're not getting it after six months, 
that's and you've articulated i want an opportunity to do this or here i'm i'm here i'm i'm willing to help um you know that's when it's time to really i think begin looking at, at other opportunities and accept that like sometimes it's not that they didn't love you or they didn't like you or you weren't even valued just sometimes the opportunity doesn't align and we're all looking for that moment where the opportunity uh meets our like our own professional needs and wants yeah i think that's so true um and for folks who who are looking for a job they can certainly come to the muse and try to um, it's like, it's, you know, that's the funny thing about us sitting here talking about this learning which is like the muse and fairy god of us are actually providing the the biggest thing that i hear from women that they need which is just like opportunities right? Like it is like, where do I even start? How do I even get my, my foot in the door? And as I know you wanted to talk about, like, that's also hard for women, like yeah. both because, you know, there's a, a lot of biases in hiring practices. It took me a very long time to understand that like, it is okay if you know people or if you can figure out, if you can go on LinkedIn and be like, okay, like I know this person who knows this person who knows someone who works at the Muse and they have three jobs that I think are very interesting, how to navigate asking for those connections so that you're not a, a random resume in a random pile. And so what I wanna say from a likability perspective is, it is okay to do that type of asking. It actually makes you a super savvy person to be doing that type of asking. Um, and the easier you can make it for the person you're asking, the better. I saw this listing. Mm. This is why I would be great for it. Please find my CV attached. Do you know X who is the hiring recruiter on it? Like That's the type of thing that makes me want to keep helping. I, I agree. And I would kind of second that advice. When, when when I get an email with a very clear, very discreet, actionable ask, it's like, great, I can move on this. Yes. Um, yes. I would love so, nothing more than to like cross things off my to-do. That's right. That's right. And feel like, you know, we can be helpful, but in, in a in a very kind of um, packaged way. Um, because I, I think those of us who, who do want to be helpful and, and do want to sponsor and do want to advance careers, um, it's, you know, you just want to make sure you have a good way to do that. Um, so that that's, that's great advice. Let's talk about the angry woman archetype. You talked in the book about how to effectively channel anger and, and use it to create change, even in small ways uh, in the workplace. Uh, and you had a great story about Carly Fiorina uh, standing up for her team and, and kind of defending her team when she was a, a first time manager. Um, we're at a time in our world right now when I think a lot of folks are angry. Um, and um, and I think it's a struggle, right, to figure out how, how much of that you you kind of bring to the workplace. Um, and how, what can you share about how to channel that in, in an effective way, uh, in a way that really kind of gets what you actually want, even though it might not feel as good? So a little context on, on women being dubbed angry at work, which is being perceived as angry um, is immediately sort of a ding to a woman's competence because our expectation is that when a man is angry, when he comes into the 10 a.m. meeting and he's like, uh, like you can tell he's already agitated, we're like, oh, like the barista must have gotten his coffee order wrong. Like, oh, <laughs> someone must have rear-ended him. Like... When a woman is angry, we're like, there's just something wrong with her, right? Like nothing happened to her. There's there's not an outside force that is causing frustration. Like she is just internally unhinged, which also means she is not capable of doing her job. That's all rubbish, but that is sort of the, the gut response that we have. There's no greater threat to a woman at work than being perceived a, as angry. I will say, interestingly, there is a corollary for men, which is when men cry at work, when men express sort mm. of like great emotion, they're very often questioned whether or not they are strong enough to, to be a leader. So it's one of the few places where you see like a real direct thing there. Um, I think it is fundamentally and like to the point of that Carly Fiorina thing about um, clarity, expressing the 
frustration, um, expressing solutions to the frustration and really um, having that sort of righteous anger being driven by a value and ideally a value that aligns with the organization you're in such that you can express it that way, right? That it's like, we value customer service and we are letting our customers down by X, Y, Z. You know, we value teamwork and yet we are consistently not including this person in our teams. Um, and so an ability, again, to articulate um, frustration or anger in a way that is um, solutions oriented and in a way that aligns with an organization's goal. I will also say um, in sort of this nebulous conversation about allyship, I think it's also where there's an opportunity for a lot of us to step in as allies um, and peers to other people because sometimes sort of when a person particularly a woman particularly a woman of color is passionate which is like you want passionate people on your team you want people who care a lot about the work and the organization you want them to show up in a way that is invested um, very often when women of color identify a problem they become a problem yeah. And so sort of a willingness even just to create space and say like, no, 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 like I, I really want to actually take a listen to what it is Maria is saying. Why don't we regroup? Like just making sure that when people, you know, are brave enough to express those frustrations that those of us who have more privilege in whatever context are willing to say like, let's let this breathe for a second yeah. and, and not every decision needs to be made in real time. That's a great point. I, I think you know some of our many of our users are are, are allies, and I think um, it's a great point about just supporting those voices um, without kind of taking up too much of the space, but just really allowing that voice to be heard and supported. I'm just going to do a quick round robin of some questions, um, and and then we can kind of dive into some of them or, or we'll move on if we want to. Is remote work better or worse for women? I think that depends on whether or not you are the type of worker who has control of your time and has flexibility. I think the challenges of remote work for women are that a lot of the things that we sort of can hyper focus on stylistically are almost more um, clear in a remote environment. I think it's hard to separate sort of your work and personal life um, in a remote environment. But man, the flexibility, like the ability to throw in a load of laundry on a conference call is personally wonderful, but I, I think it is in some ways less about gender and more about whether or not you are the type of person who is in the position um, to grant yourself flexibility with or without remote work. That's a great point. If you had to pick one thing for women to look for in a boss, what would it be? You know, I used to just look for people who were just like me stylistically because like I'm I'm low confrontation. So like I always hated having a high confrontation boss, though I often found I would end up gravitating to these people who are high confrontation. And what I want to say is part of what you want to be looking for is someone who is sometimes stylistically different than you, because in that contrast, you will learn how to stretch and how to grow. And you'll also be really valuable to that boss. I mean, once you can sort of get to a place where you understand you're not different just for the purpose of driving each other nuts, you're actually different because that is makes for a better, stronger, more dynamic team. Um, that's it. And then secondarily, just someone who is who understands that leadership is not about doling out titles. Leadership is about those micro opportunities where you say, you know what, today I'm going to have, um, you know, this person lead the call, like all of those little things that allow a person to step into leadership, someone who's willing to grant you those opportunities. That's really what you want to be looking for. That's great advice. And I, and I love the first point too, um, because I think it also asks you to do some self-reflection and to say, okay, who am I and what really is my style and how can I grow? I want to talk a little bit about um, the weekend uh, because it has, for those of you who don't know, um, Alicia has a, a relatively new show on MSNBC, The Weekend, um, that has been making news just for how great it's doing, aside from everything else and, and the great content that, that's on it. Can you talk a little bit about how you've carved your own voice in, in such a crowded media space? 
Yeah, with a, a lot of mistakes and figuring out. I mean, first part of what I would say is I did not fully transition into working in media in sort of a paid capacity where my primary source of income was media until I was 28 or 29 which is to say there's like a whole early part of my career that was working in nonprofits, that was working on political campaigns. And that was partly how I got some exposure to media. But I was one of those people, for those of you with whom this will resonate, like I thought I knew what I wanted to do since I was about five or six. Like I was either going to become a Broadway actress or I was going to go to law school and run for office. And I worked on a campaign straight out of college and realized that that was not what I wanted to do. And, and in part, because I realized I was like, here we were trying to like pump out a message day after day. And then the media would just sort of decide what the narrative of the day was. And it became intriguing to me from the vantage point of like, oh, like, they have so much power. They have so much power to shape the conversation that people are having that will ultimately impact the choices they make at the grocery store, at the at the voting booth, and like, what are they doing over there? And so I was like a 23, 24 year old with no connections in that world. My first job in television, I got off of a website formerly known as Craigslist. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember, and if you're not, it's like, crazy site. You could find like roommates, <laughs> find job listings, but I got a job um, in Westchester. And so one, just to say for those of you who sort of thought you knew what you wanted to do and then realized you were wrong, that's okay. Um, and there is just a like intense period of catch up. I think that comes with that. Like, so the humility of you're going to need an extra six months to a year to be like, what do I not know? And I think I did it right where I think getting a job just inside, it didn't matter. I mean, listen, it wasn't ABC. It wasn't NBC. It was a must carry station in Westchester, New York. But in essence, I got a secondary degree just by sitting around listening to people and being really humble and learning a lot of the mechanics of a newsroom just by being there and by osmosis. And then eventually an opportunity opened up to do a little r reporting. I was like, on it periodically being like, are there any opportunities? Like, oh, I found this great story. Perhaps I could just borrow a camera and go do it. And then once I did it and uh, you know, upper management saw it, they're like, oh, she could do this. And that little bit of validation was all I needed to know that I was on the right path. It still took years. Like, I think if you are like me also, and you have this push and pull between I value security, um, but I also want to take big risks and do big things. Um, that's like a a, an, an always tension. And then the other always tension is, and this is where Lauren, I think you and I are probably exactly the same, which is like, I, I was like ready to lead on day one, or I thought I was ready. To <laughs> lead on one. I would like come in like a wrecking ball to every organization I'd ever been a part of because that like worked from first grade to college on group projects, right? We're like, I'm just going to handle this people. Everybody I got it. And like, people were very happy to hand things over. It turns out in the real world, that's not how it works. And that like telling people I was a leader, was not the same as what I was going to need to do, which was like to sit back, learn some workplace culture in each, each place that I went, and then to begin to acclimate myself. So all to say, I am I am arguably a late bloomer. There was a woman at C at CNN who always wanted to hire me there. And then she went and launched HuffPost Live, the Huffington Post streaming site. And she brought me in for an audition. I killed the audition. She hired me there. And then things were on a little bit more uh, of a path. But what it means is I came up through what would become the future. Like I came up through streaming news video and information. And so I, I feel in many ways, like the skills I developed in this one year of time, um, when we were working at HuffPost Live, where it's like there was audience interface, there was um, like live breaking news, the, the Boston um, Marathon massacre happened while we're on air, we're on air for eight wow. hours live and like learning how to do things in real time. I think sometimes there's an instinct to want to go to the biggest place you can possibly going to go that's going to look the biggest and the shiniest on your resume. And I do think that I benefited in the long run from working at slightly smaller niche places, but where I was given a lot of opportunity and a lot of room to run. And if you're the type of person who just like soak stuff in like a sponge, that's what I did. And so part of it was like the streaming piece of it, but part of it was also news and information is changing. And, you know, what we do, uh, you know, during my hours at MSNBC is called perspective journalism. I would argue it is actually much more transparent in the future of journalism, which is, this is who I am. This is where I come from. And here are the facts. 
as we know them. And here are sort of my extrapolations of why this matters and the impact that is going to have on you. I would argue that everyone has a perspective, the decision of like what what makes the front page of a newspaper. That is an editorial perspective. The decision of like, um, you know, whose voice is opinion and whose voice not. That's a perspective. There's perspective in so much of the news and information that we gather that I think like what it taught me was it is okay to just be really honest and clear and transparent with people about where your own fault lines are. Wow. Um, I'm going to more than you asked and, for and, and, and you send like that out to everyone I know. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that is, um, I, I think that's such insight about where we are with journalism today, um, where, which I'm not particularly um, expert at talking about, but certainly resonates. And, and I think your advice about being in a place where you can really just soak things up and kind of learn and earn um, credibility is, is spectacular advice. I, I'm going to just go back quickly to okay. to this book. You published the like Trap, again, right here, uh, in 2019. And, and for a lot of us, it's been it's been a long five years. Um, <laughs> a lot has changed. How has your point of view changed uh, about the world um, since since you wrote this? Like, what's the sort of um, epilogue to to the book? I love this question so much. Um, I also love that you're like my Vanna White with the book. So thank you well, for yeah, continuing yeah. to show the cover. Thank you. Um, you know, cover it, up. Um, it is like really tricky to be a person who cares about likability and then write, r- writes a book about likability and then has people like and not like the book. And one of the sort of uh, fundamental critiques of specifically Amazon reviewers, some of whom were like, the cover came dirty. And I'm like, well, that's not my fault. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> gave me a two-star review, but that really feels like the bookseller was the problem there. Um, and was that there was like not enough solutions or that like it was depressing because people are already living this and they didn't want to hear about it again. And what I would say to that was like, there were some moments, there have been some moments where I've been like, oh, that's it. Like, that's the thing we're going for. And one of those moments was um, during the 2020 presidential campaign when Joe P- Joe Biden was deciding on a running mate. And we knew um, that it was going to be a woman. And ordinarily, as you all know, when people are, are like have their names being buzzed about as a potential VP pick, uh, they like will demure. They'll be like, me? Um, no, like, like, you know, <laughs> And it's like, meanwhile, it's like they have an entire like operation trying to make sure that they get the nomination. They're being vetted. Um, and I saw something that I, I've i never seen before during this campaign, which was you had all of these women whose names were in circulation. I often credit Stacey Abrams. I, I believe it was it was at least she was the first person I saw do it where she was asked about it, perhaps on one of the Sunday morning shows. You know, would you want to be vice president? And she said, yes. I'd love to be vice president. I think I'd be a great vice president. Let me tell you about the qualifications I have that would make me a great vice president. Um, and then she would wrap it in a bow where she'd say, but whoever Joe Biden picks, I will support that ticket and be so excited for them. And then and then Kamala Harris did it, um, Barbara Lee did it. And it what it meant for those of us in media or the chattering class was we weren't looking at it and saying like, well, was that a strategy? Like, did Stacey Abrams choose the right strategy? No, she just made it normal to be ambitious and want things for yourself and to go to the mat for yourself because you're not going to go to the mat for yourself then who's going to do it for you. And and to me, what the, the lesson for those of us who may never be a, a VP pick was if it became normal for women to be ambitious and to see themselves as leaders and to be and to be given the space to affirm that they wanted those opportunities and it wasn't just one woman doing it but all women doing it then there's like no point of difference right and there's safety in those numbers um and so to me that gave me sort of a north star of like that's the idea is to normalize the fact that all people lead in very different ways. It's not just women. Women should have the capacity to show up as a warm communal leader if that is what her organization needs and that's what yields results. She should be allowed to show up as a super assertive, sharp-elbowed leader if that's what the occasion calls for. And there should be a range of styles that are perfectly acceptable. Create more space so that when you close your eyes and you think of a leader, 
there are so many different visions that then can pop into your head. I think that's great. That, that, that's, that's so true. And I think, you know, what, what I found was really valuable um, as I was going through my own, <laughs> my own lawsuit and, and, and my own challenges in the workforce um, was just naming, naming the likability trap and being able to say, here it is in print. Here's what it is. It's, it's immediately obvious to people as soon as you say the likability trap, you know, and, and I think that that just gives it real power and, and being able to point to it and name it and it becomes part of our vocabulary in the workplace so that you can throw it out there and it's not accusatory, um, but it just frames it in a way that that kind of allows people to recognize what's going on without coming across <laughs> sort of back to your earlier points about being angry, uh, but it, it just it, it just names it, right? That That is the power of, of being able to uh, encapsulate a, a trend in such a pithy and effective way. Well, if uh, you want to leave an Amazon review, Lauren, you are welcome to, because the, that, that, that was exactly the point, which is I, I think a lot of us are like, am I crazy? Right, like I'm, I'm being made to feel crazy about the fact that like, especially, what I think is interesting is there are people like us who are assertive and that like behooves us our entire lives, right? Like maybe someone doesn't like you in middle school, like all, you know, like you sort of like along the way, you get a lot of notes about the fact that you're a lot, and like, <laughs> oh, but then you still like get into elite institutions because you have been a lot and like you get great job offers because you've been a lot. And that's why I think it's like really confusing then when you're like, but this thing has propelled me so far why is it only now that I am like nearing the peak that I'm being told that this is a real problem and a thing I need to work on? And the same for women who've just like been like gracious and lovely and warm and like the team mom on every team they've ever been on. And then they get to a point where it's like, well, you just don't have it. And it's like, well, that's weird because that same quality brought me to this point. So right. like, and the thing I found most confusing, Lauren, is I've been given both sets of feedback in different contexts. I have been told mm. I am too much. Wow. I've been told I am not enough. And like the thing that underscores is just how subjective this all is, right? That if I worked at a hedge fund, I'd probably be seen as like way too chill and like way too like lovey dovey and warm. And, you know, conversely, if I like worked in um, some more female dominant fields that I would be seen as like too hard nosed because of the context. Wow. Yeah. Context matters. Um, well, look, I think I, I think you know just just publishing it and and getting it out there gives us all I think a lot of hope about um, the future. Can I ask if there's a, a another project in the works? Uh, no, I want to do a whole different universe of things. I want to do some scripted projects. I want to do maybe a kids book. Um, but this was like a labor of love. I mean, it's I I published this a few years ago, like I'm still sitting and living with it. And that works because I care so much about this and I find it so intriguing. But um, if you're going to write a book, Lauren Bonner, make sure that you're obsessed with the topic. Okay. Good advice. Good advice. Uh, well, in the meantime, I'll just maybe reread yours. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm up for it. Easier. So much easier. Honestly, great idea. Yeah, maybe more fun. But um, Anyway, Alicia, I want to thank you so much um, for making the time today. And, and thank you to everyone out there who's who's been listening in. If you enjoyed the discussion as much as I have um, and you, you want to hear more from Alicia or um, want to see more of her, I encourage you to, to find the likability trap um, or listen to her podcast, Latina to Latina. And then, of course, you can tune in this weekend and every weekend. Uh, to see her on MSNBC's The Weekend, alongside uh, Simone Sanders Townsend and Michael Steele. Thank you again. It's wonderful to see you and uh, really appreciate all the excellent advice that you gave to really all of us. Thank you. Thank I you. Love this. Thanks. Bye-bye.